Well, welcome, folks. We're here at uh, Larry Dickin Family's a farm at Camden, Ontario in the Niagara Peninsula. And we're talking about planters and drills and air seeders today. And uh, Larry and uh, Ben have made quite a few changes in their uh, planting uh, implements the last couple of years. And uh, we're gonna talk about those. And this is mainly about sort of that decision-making process. How do you make the decision as to that planter's gotta go? And is, is the going being a refurbisher? Is it being a brand new unit? Is it being a used unit from somebody else that's been well-maintained? So talking through that, helping others to, to understand how to make those important decisions when you look at the cost of things nowadays, eh, Larry? So um, <clears throat> maybe just describe the farm, uh, Larry, in terms of uh, you know, where are you today versus where you've come from and uh, who's currently involved in the farm with you. I farm together with my son, Ben. Uh, our wives are actively involved in logistics and the many behind the scene things that it takes so that we can do what we do. Um, uh, our history is, uh, we started into the no-till journey in the mid-90s with soys and wheat. Uh, first drill we bought was a 750. Our local soil and crop association started with a hay buster probably in 91, 92. All the directors on the association kicked in funds to, to finance the thing and then the funds were deducted as we rented it. So, that, you know, went, went from that, I rented a tie drill one spring, and, and from that, by 94, I bought a 750. Just talk briefly about the crop mix in terms of, uh, you know, what crops are you growing in your rotation, and a little bit about the slopes and the soil types that you're dealing with. Sure. Uh, crop mix is corn, soys, wheat, sunflowers, buckwheat. We were into edibles up until, well, this is our first year and probably about 12 or 13, we don't have any edibles in the mix. Our soil isn't great for edibles, but I've got some landlords that didn't want soys and so you do what you gotta do to make things work. Soil types and slopes, it's, it's a heavy Haldeman clay. We have some pockets near St. Catharines of nicer soil, but they're small pockets. The vast majority of it is really, really heavy clay. Uh, Again, some of it is, is flat and some of it has some mean slope. And, and we've found on the, on the slope that our winter erosion, you know, we can still lose soil, especially in the wintertime. As our clays come out of a frost, they're very fragile and that's when they move. Based on the crop mix that you've got, what are the units that plant those crops? The corn and the sunflowers are planted by the corn planter, which is a horse maestro now. Uh, the soys, the wheat, the buckwheat, uh, so, and the broad acre cover crops are planted by, for this us this year, it's a horse avatar, this is our first year with it. Uh, and Coming then, out of? Uh, a John Deere 1890. Then um, we can talk about why that switch. And then the interseeding, which happens in the corn and the soys, is done with a, a Hendrix fabricating interseeder with Salford Row units on it that we bought in 17, I think. So you, you bought that unit the way it is or you adapted it to work in what you were trying to accomplish? The, the way Hendrix builds them is, is in components. And so when we bought it, it was a full trail type. But we found that many of our fields are smaller and so doing headlands, especially with a full trail type, the, the unit blight was significant. And, uh, and so then we, we separated the unit and uh, so converted it to a three-point hitch bar, which it was already inside there. So we took a three-point hitch bar and pull a tank. And what do you consider and you, you've had to make a lot of considerations because you've switched over. What do you consider when it's time to explore changing out the current planting equipment? The corn planter, the, the first year we were in it, we had, we had a Kinsey lift and turn. And after our first year in, in plant green for a number of years, that planter was done. It had started with new components. The row units were twisted. Uh, we overhauled it and, and it, it left here in great shape but it needed a full overhaul. Um, and part of that was because we had a, a single disc fertilizer coulter cutting here and that broke the ground open, which let the row unit in, but the row unit twisted towards the fertilizer coulter. 
every one of them. And so, okay, that planter is not heavy enough. So then we went to a case uh, 1240, really like the planter, except that we found on our on a roll, sometimes the wings wouldn't go in. And, and, and we found other situations where, you know, we were set at two inches, but all of a sudden three or four plants would be at an inch and a quarter. Uh, for us, it's, it's really crit I think for all of us, it's critical that the seed get in to the depth that it needs to be. And so for us, we said, we think we need a heavier planter. Again, if, if you've got a planter that you can make go in to the depth you want and it's 40 years old and you can maintain it, then drive on. When you buy a new unit or acquire a, a good used unit, uh, often you're changing size and stuff like that. And, uh, but, you know, but are there other aspects of the system that you have to consider are gonna change as you change that planting? Yes, and when we switched from the 1890 deer to the avatar, we did gain 10 feet. If you really want to know, this might sound really selfish and lazy, but when, what pushed us to begin exploring the, the switch was that in 2022, we were planting an IP bean for Hensel, and it's a very large seeded variety, and we had to up the seeding rate because of germ quality issues. And we couldn't get it to flow through the Venturi on the CCS system without slowing down. If we're looking anyway, uh, we're looking at something different. I wasn't willing, I, I wasn't really prepared to go to an air cart system. Um, one of the interesting things in, in the whole conversation surrounds road transport. If I wanted to go to a, even a 36 foot deer, will transport the same width as a 30, but the road height gets to be, I don't have the specs, 14 and a half to 15 feet, which is a problem for low wires. Um, if I wanna to go to a 40 foot unit, now I'm almost at 18 feet wide. And, and so road transport is a very real consideration. And so the Horsch Avatar we bought is a 40 foot unit and it transports at 12 and a half feet wide. And 12 and a half feet high. So I don't have concerns about wires and, and I've got a unit that, uh, anyway, as, as we looked at it, it, it's just, it's a single unit. I'm not towing an air cart and, and it's, it's much more. Um, and the other thing is, I, Ben has a bad back and I'm not as young as I once was. And a John Deere air seeder involves a lot of time underneath it on maintenance. <laughs> and the last time I crawled out from under that thing in 2022, I, after being under it for a few days, I thought I hurt <laughs> in ways that I hadn't hurt in the past. So again, by going to a single rank unit, we can work at waist height or at standing up behind it. And like they seem, they, they've, you know, county fathers or whoever seem to forget that, you know, roads needed shoulders and those are sort of absent around this geography combined with a lot of traffic coming out of the lower valley right yes so uh, yeah it's and that's and that's a very real thing do, do i feel that i have the god-given right to make my equipment as wide as i want and it's up to everybody else to get out of my way when i'm maneuvering on the road i don't think i do and and so when some of the manufacturers are willing to look at things like transport widths and heights um, for me, that's important. So in terms of the planter that you buy for the system now, would you have to buy that same planter if you were still in conventional? Like, you know, no. in this case, the planter needs to match the system in terms of the ruggedness of the weight to be able to penetrate what can be some pretty tough soils. And we say that they're tough soils and that sort of scares people, but once you get the seed in there, it's still going into a very nice seed bed. It's just tougher to get there sometimes, depending on the It spring. is, and, it, and it's still clay. It's, it's not, it, it, things don't grow here the way, you know, we don't, we don't see the growth rates of, of here on Perth, Oxford. Um, so when you sort of did your homework to decide what planters you were going to buy and, and went the route that you went, or is there a difference between what you absolutely had to have on that new unit versus what might be nice to have? And, you know, so what are those things that you absolutely had to have to make that unit whole for what you were trying to do? The absolute critical thing was 
the, the weight transfer to the row unit. That was absolutely critical. Um, the fact that it's electric motor drive, I'm not crazy about that. I still like a mechanical drive. Mm. <laughs> but anyway, it is what it is. And, uh, you know, we've got good service people. And, and the, the challenge is you can't look at an electric motor or electric wire in the wintertime and know whether it needs to be replaced or not. Mm. On, the, on the Avatar drill, what I would love to have is a scale system. I, you know, but on this particular unit that they don't have a scale system. We, it's, it's, a, it's a metering role that they have a really good calibration system on and we can, get, we can get accurate there. The nice thing with a scale is punching in what you know is there and, and you, know when you're, you know when you're really empty or how close you are. You had said, I think, a, f a few minutes ago that you were in liquid fertilizer, but I thought the horses were all dry fertilizer no, machines. No, they're, they're all liquid. Well, we have liquid. Okay. The, the maestro we found out of Saskatchewan had liquid on it, so it had a seed tank and a liquid tank. Okay. And we added a second liquid system because we're dropping both 28% and a liquid starter. And the two, of course, don't get along. So, um, and on the... Avatar, it's got a two tank system. It's, it's used, uh, had 9,000 acres on it, but it had never seen fertilizer. Uh -huh. And so again, we built a liquid system for it. What about section control and things like that? How important are those? On the corn plant are critical. We've got row shot offs. I've had them for eight or nine years and they're, they're lovely things. Um, my, my Avatar is, is half width. And I know there's been some conversation. I don't know enough about the engineering, you know, on the avatar because it's, it's two towers. Um, could we not figure out some way to get section control by, by sectioning off various sections of the towers? And since we're electric drives, you know, is there an algorithm that could make the metering roll just slow down? It's for us, that's not a big deal. Okay. Um, the half width is nice and uh, but on the, on the drill it's not as critical and so what was the sort of the one thing of each of those planters that sold you that that was the unit you were going to go buy the maestro uh, the corn planter was the uh, was the weight transfer and to get the seed in the ground the avatar um, <laughs> the weight transfer and again, single rank, it's on 10 inch spacing and not having to crawl around underneath it. Interesting. Okay, very good. So now, Larry, we've got some pictures of the old John Deere drill here. And uh, I'm just going to go through and talk about, you know, how this uh, drill performed for you. And then we can talk about, um, you know, why you moved to the Avatar. We'll go outside and walk around sure. the machine as you've been uh, doing the maintenance on it to get it ready for fall. So just go ahead. This is pictures that were taken in the spring of 22. 2022. Uh, other than the, the struggle with the seed sizing issue in 2022, which is really the first time we'd ever run into it, uh, that 1890 worked great for us. It, it really did. Uh, we put a pile of acres on it over the 15 years that we ran it. And, uh, you know, the last number of years we would, change opener blades every year. We weren't fully worn. We were at about two thirds, but by the time we got to the winter time, we'd be fully beyond worn. So it was just part of the in season or winter maintenance that, that we uh, did put a full set of blades on it every year. Um, when we decided to look at expansion or, or changing units, I said, if we're going to change, we're going to increase capacity. And this picture here, is this pretty common that one of you is combining while the other one's planting to, just to keep those, you've got, you've got, you're touchy on planting days in the fall, right? We're absolutely touchy. And, and I, if I was saying this was the scenario that we always ran and I'd be lying. This, <laughs> this goal. was a perfect day. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the combine probably had been shut down for rain and we were able to catch right up. And, uh, you know, this, this is a perfect day. Uh, we try to get as close behind as we can, but it's, it's just Ben and I running in harvest. And so, you know, if trucks are moving and the combine's got to relocate and many times uh, some days you know the header comes off the machine five six times to relocate well those are not days where that's going to be able to happen 
Understood. And this was amazing to me and again back in the spring of 22 when you invited me down. And this is this is what you were seeding into. This was phenomenal. That's gorgeous. <laughs> and this is a, this is sort of back to the mindset thing, right? Most people would be horrified by thinking that you were going to have any success with that whatsoever. And yeah. yet you, this is what you want to see. It is. Uh, it it cuts easy. It plants. Um, we've made some mistakes doing it, but we made mistakes doing conventional. You know, we had soil crusting issues. We had all like, we don't have crusting issues when we do this. And what's your program right after this operation happens? Herbicidal termination. And, and it'll be, uh, I'm not sure if we were planting soys here and they're IP soys. So it'll be a glyphosate with Aragon for fleabane and then metribuzin, um, Zidua. So, so a broad spectrum uh, weed program expecting to come in uh, at the you know, second trifoliate stage with classic and sure or something. Very good. And that, that like it's lush, it's taking up those treatments, it's quickly burning down and it really is not yeah. a deterrent. No. Okay. And no. there's just another picture to give you even, it almost looks like you're in waves with a powerboat or something. <laughs> and, and you know, one of the conversations is people will say, well, why don't you take that off and feed it to livestock? One of the things that comes back and well, first of all, I don't have livestock to feed it to. But one of the things that we keep coming back to a lot of our agriculture is based on the idea if it's in the field and above the ground, we need to remove it because we get into that conversation around wheat straw against again, whatever. But that if nutrient transfer is biological, which we know it is, there's been a pile of nutrient transfer from the soils into here and it's there now for succeeding crops and not in an erodible form. Okay, so this is sort of the business end of that drill? Yes, uh, so here we're planting into an interseeded stand. Uh, that's Italian ryegrass, so we found that easier to kill than annual. I know there's conversations about that, but whatever. Uh, we, we tried one year, the narrow gauge wheels found on our soils that that was the, the narrow gauge wheel had a bit of an indent along the blade and it was allowing the sidewall to blow out and giving me some closing issues on my soil in my situation. I know a lot of guys love those narrow closing wheels uh, and our avatar has about a three inch, but it doesn't have that. It doesn't have that inset that the one. Mm. So we went back to a four inch wheel. Uh, it's got the... Um, it's got the little rubber seed firming wheel and then it's got a Martin notched wheel on it. And uh, yeah, we, it, it did a great job. Happy with the drill. This is the corn planter in 2022. We found, uh, I, I like to plant corn into what we saw the no-till drill running, but in 2022, we lost all our legumes in the winter time due to weather. And so when we pulled into plant, we just had volunteer wheat. And so this was my first experience planting into something like that. And and our results weren't as positive as I'd hoped. It was still a solid crop. And this was sort of first situation with that it was. green cover and the first time with the planter. The first day out with the planter. So maybe it was first, first day blues, I don't know. But uh, again, there you, so you can see the saddle tanks and those are our starter fertilizer. The seed is in the back hopper and the front tank is a 750 gallon liquid tank. And what I like about some of this European planting technology is, because I'm the compaction guy, is how much rubber you can get under these things compared to sort of some of the North American planting equipment. And not just that, when I talk about the weight coming off the carrier unit onto the toolbar, we take the squat out of those tires. Those tires are still touching the ground and turning, but there is no squat. That's how much weight gets transferred. So we do not have a pinch row issue going down the field. And there's lots of things happening on that planter. There's lots of things happening on that planter. Uh, now, across the front there, you see um, the red ball monitors. But now that we're running a Excellus Max, which is blue, we can hardly, we may, we may bypass the, the, those red ball monitors. I've never found them to be a huge help on any of our systems. So they're there because they came on the unit, um, but they might get plumbed away. And here's the business end of that here's unit. Here's the business end of the row unit. Uh, there's a crimp roller. I know Ian's got a couple of pictures coming at us. Uh, it's, it's a double disc unit with uh, a seed firming wheel running in the row. 
there is liquid pop-up going down in the row and then on the back we've got uh, an extreme yeah copperhead ag extreme cruiser wheel uh, when we're planting into a really heavy cover crop mat there isn't a i haven't found a closing wheel that'll go through and that's kind of again why we need to go deep because the top half inch might not close because of roots but we go down and it's crumbly and loose and it's closed so here you see our, our crop roller. Uh, Dawn equipment that builds the rollers build a row clearing unit. We've never run that. We simply have a diverter that we built to, to push the cover crop down and get it away from the bearings on the roller itself. And it just sets it aside a little bit. And uh, so we're planting into, into green. And, and there you can see, again, this wasn't particularly heavy cover but there's, there's nothing to clear the row. Uh, we are depending on the row unit to cut, but any of that green stuff there, it cuts, it's no problem. And even in the type of cover crop mass we were seeing with the, uh, with yeah. the John Deere drill. I, I, again, guys talk about I, I, cover crops have to be at the certain stage and you have to have the right crop if you're going to terminate it with a roller. Our crops aren't, we'll plant when the field is ready, not when the cover crop is ready because we're in Niagara. And uh, this picture just sort of showing the, the, like the oomph of that unit. Like that is a massive piece of... It is, and yet we're pulling it with an 8100 deer at 165 or 170 horse. It, uh, the tractor has, has lots to, to deal with it. Hmm. And um, you know, so we don't have a big tractor on it. And again, th this picture is sort of coming having the planter come at you and yep. that's not the, co the cover crop mass that you want you want more than that i would but it just that. it's amazing how it just goes right through because one of the interesting things with this is you know we're planting a grass into a grass whereas if i have a whole bunch of legumes there that little bit of grass which is volunteer wheat is counterbalanced by this 80 percent legumes and and there is no negative impact from crop was there a negative impact here I'm still not sure. Um, uh, Mike Ballon is getting away with it, so maybe I need to spend more time talking to him. And again, one of the things that a planter in your environment has to deal with is is mud <laughs> that's gonna can get in the way of things. Yes, it doesn't take a lot to start building up on depth wheels and and make us stop. Although, again, if we're planting into a cover, all of a sudden, and, and Ben did this a couple of years ago. He planted well into a rain that would normally have had a stop, but he was planting in heavy cover and, and he was able to roll. It was still planting well and, and finish the field. And you find you have less buildup in, in the environment where you've got all this cover crop mass that you're going yeah, into? It hasn't been an issue. Very good. And again, the so closing. The closing, you can see, so the starter fertilizer goes down in the row. That white tube is carrying our 28 and we're dropping it three inches to the side of the row on the surface. In many ways, I'd love to explore a way to get it in the ground. We just, with all the other hardware and the crimp rollers, I haven't figured that out yet, but maybe that's just an engineering thing. So the, the weight transfer and the drown pressure, are you getting that at an individual unit basis or is it, how, how does that work? I think on this unit, it, it runs on, uh, Ben could correct me, but I, I think it might be set up in fours across there and I don't know if we can change that. I'd love it on an individual unit, but it's it's doing what we need it to do. And this is just the back end as you're going yep. and uh, you really can't see that a row is planted there no. in this environment. And this isn't the cover crop that you're normally planting no. into. What will show up is, is the nitrogen within a day or two will burn the area beside the row. So then you can begin to find the row. One of the challenges with doing this kind of stuff, it's really hard to take plant stands when the corn is spearing out of the ground. You know, you can't see it till it gets to be two, three, four leaves. You can't row it till it gets to be four or five. Okay. So. <laughs> <laughs> and here's your closing wheels set here's up here. Here's our closing wheels. There's nothing on the front of the row unit to cut. We are depending on the coulter, on the, on the double discs to get in the ground. And that doesn't seem to be a problem. I saw this planter no. on the road show that you had come down in 21, I think. Uh, I saw that planter seeding into forage stand that yes. had just been taken off for hay. And I was shocked at how well mm -hmm. it planted. So, yeah. Okay. It, it's still just a tool. We can make mistakes with it, 
Um, and, and this is what we have bought for our context. And if someone else is in a context where they're making theirs work and it's, it doesn't have to be a fancy new planter. Mm -hmm. You know, we need to get the seed in the ground and the seed needs to grow. So some of the things that we have added, we did add an alpine liquid fertilizer system to it. And Ben and I both still like ground drive when we can. So we built a, a ground drive system that runs with an electric clutch. We really like the unit and, and the fact that it's, it's a 40 foot wide seeding unit that picks up and folds at, at 12 and a half feet wide is, is really important. And the camera might not pick it up, but you've got many of the closing wheels off here as you're maintaining and it's giving you a real good uh, view of the, um, the seed wheel. And that seems like a very big wheel compared to what I'm used to seeing. Uh, the John Deere 1890 had a wheel that was pretty similar to that. Um, it runs right down in the furrow, yes. This thing came in completely with smooth wheels uh, between seeding and harvest, or seeding and, and the fall now. We've sent them out for machining and turned it into a notched wheel. We had a couple on it this spring and we really liked the action of the notched wheel. So we sent these to a machine shop. Um, our, our, dry, our liquid fertilizer starter, we're going to change the tube setup. Right now we have it coming down in front of this little round wheel and we ran into some issues with it. So one of the things in the next couple of weeks is to build new fertilizer tubes that will come along and come over the top of this and drop the liquid fertilizer right here at the, in the slot yet and then have the, the wheels close it. And those are quite narrow closing wheels, or sorry, depth control wheels. These are narrower, but... Um, <laughs> They haven't given us the grief that the style of wheels had did that we did on the on the other drill because they don't have that. The ones we had on them had a had a shallower area, a reduced inside diameter here, and this is running right tight, and so it's not allowing that sidewall to blow out. The other thing that's interesting on this unit is that there's about a three or four degree angle. No, like this. This is our ground angle. So we're not only engaging the ground like this, we're engaging it like this. That was an attraction on here. And, and will that make a long-term difference when we're planting into heavy covers? Um, again, there's still, there's still a learning process. Soybeans, we don't want to be going to two and three inches deep. So we do have to figure out how to close it. So our hope was that because of the, the camber on the blade, uh, you know, is that going to allow an easier close? Time will tell. Okay. Uh, we did plant, we planted buckwheat uh, into, into some very heavy cover with the thing and it did a nice job this spring. Uh, and and some into anyway we have various pictures that of running into the ryegrass and and it did it did a nice job we did see though the two row units that had the the notched closing on it did a nicer job than the smooth and the spring down pressure looks like you have it on the highest setting yes this is on on this unit here yes we had them cranked right up and the, the other interesting thing is again I shouldn't be. This is what it is. It, this unit, we can actually angle this. This is the most aggressive and, and we, can, uh, we can angle the closing wheel in relation to the, to the row unit, which I didn't realize, but Ben did. On the first day out, I said, we're not doing a very good job. And so we took a few minutes and, and changed the angle on here and just changed completely how it worked. What had this thing been planting for the 9,000 acres before you got it? I'm assuming beans and, and some wheat. Uh, it wasn't available till the guy had his wheat planted because his new one wasn't in. And it came out of, uh, where did this come from? Indiana. Okay. I guess the, the 40 row units, every one's like the other. Um, again, our, our fertilizer system, the, that's where our filter is and it goes out to the pump on the wheel and comes back and, and is distributed. Uh, it, it just, ground drive works. It means a little more plumbing, but it works. And, and we're really quite happy with, with how that worked. Maintenance on those towers and all that hosing? Haven't run into any. Uh, like I said, the unit has never seen dry fertilizer and, and so it, it hasn't been an issue. Um, 
One of the things we did have to build and we can walk around the front is, is a fill system. We, again, we didn't want to go to a seed tender. It's, it's Ben and I, and we've been accustomed to working with gravity wagons. And uh, so we, we had to come up with a, our own fill system for it. And, and it works quite well. Uh, we're really quite happy with, with how it worked. Um, so there's, uh, again, if we come around the front, the, the toolbar goes down and the weight comes off the carry wheels. And then in here we have a hydraulic cylinder that is actually our down pressure system. So the toolbar goes down and, and sits in place. And then these cylinders here will maintain down pressure. So the down pressure is in four sections across here. And, and we're still, again, you know, when we got to the end of soybeans, we stood back and looked and, and then we do some analyzing and go, oh, that's why it did what it did. <laughs> but that's just part of, of learning our way through it. And again, you know, the compaction side of things, I just love seeing those big tires on a seed rig. You don't care at all that you're running over where the, some plants are going to be planted. No, no. Well, there, there's, like I said, the squad comes right out of those wheels. So they are, I'm trying to... It's a 520. It's a 520 85R42. Uh... And what's the pressure you're running them at, Larry? Uh, these were running at 40, and I guess in the field we could drop it. That's for road. Uh, again, the nice thing that we appreciate with the horse systems, both of them, is that we can load the planter and go down the road loaded. Uh, we did that with our 1890 drill, but with the, the corn planter, both the Case and the Kinsey, you didn't want to have that planter full when you lifted and turned it. it, it like. You just didn't, not not as a as a rule. Because you had you were essentially lifting and turning the entire weight of the planter, as opposed to here you're just doing the toolbar. And and the the whole transport system is designed to take the weight, so that you know. Again, when we have small fields uh, in uh, with a corn planter. I can fill Ben and he's good for 50 or 60 acres and I can park the truck at the next spot. I can go do other things. Whereas if he's in with previous planters, I had to be with him because he just couldn't, he couldn't fill and carry that much stuff. So we built our, it, it's a three tank system because uh, I wanted 500 gallons of fertilizer that will match a full load of wheat seed uh, for, for fill. And, um, and so we built that. This is our, our fill system. We got the auger came from Unverfirth. They said we, they had nothing for us. We said, we know. And so we, we built the rest and it works really, really well. Uh, parallel arm system here comes up. And, and so the, uh, we, we can bring the auger right down to this height. I've got pictures I can show you. Um, and uh, we unfold the auger and then and then put it up and then we drive into our wagon and it and it works. So seed in the back or fertilizer in the back? Seed in both. Oh, so all the fertilizer is in these white tanks, not... No, on the corn planter, the one tank is fertilizer, but here it's seed in both. Depending, I mean, cover crop, canola will just be running one, but soybeans, we ran both. But if you wanted to go to dry, you could use one of those for dry fertilizer? But I don't want to. <laughs> because a lot of guys are still trying to stay with dry, right? And have, have the capacity and the easy filling. Yes. And this system is. This system can be dry fertilizer, dry fertilizer and seed. Okay. But again, we did, we, that's not where we are. And, uh, and so we wanted to stay with the liquid. So this is our, our interseeder. We usually tow a wagon with a thousand gallon tank for 28%. It's in winter storage already. Um, it's fairly simple. You can see two row units going down every row. We drop our, our nitrogen right here, uh, essentially in, in a variation on a wide drop system. Again, one of the things we discovered, we were struggling with, with interseed emergence the first couple of years we had a really long tube here and the fertilizer was just dancing and we discovered we have to shorten the tubes and concentrate the fertilizer so that we don't get it into the into the seed row um, and you really don't want it on the equipment either 
No, it, it, it still, it still gets on the closing wheels and stuff. And so, you know, a thorough power wash and, and lots of, lots of spray oil to, to put it into storage for the winter. Uh, in its first iteration, uh, you know, this was a cart form. Um, so we went to the three point hitch style, uh, Hendrix fabricating built us the, the lift assist just because it's a pile of hardware on a tractor that's not very big. And, uh, and and the lift assist works great. And then we hook a, a cart on the back of it. There's our, our tank for our cover crop seed and it's simply blowing up and drop down every row. And what do you have the Velmar and the tank um, matched to acre wise? No, well the, the tank uh, at a thousand gallons, we're dropping 30 pounds or 30 gallons. So it's doing 32, 33 gallons. That tank right full will do about 55, 60. So, but we still pretty well when we stop to fill 28, <coughs> we'll top that up. And, and that we're still handling in small bags. Uh, just, just because it's only a, it's only a 600 pound or 700 pound box. That's more than a, you know, a tote won't empty over that and it just works. So on that one, we're still handling small bags. Everything else is, is bulk. And this is only used in corn and sunflowers and sunflowers. Okay. So like 30 inch row spacing and you know, how many times out of 10 are you successful in, in seeing a, a cover crop establish itself there? Uh, we're probably in the past been at about 50%. Um, but last year was really interesting because we, we planted full job for a neighbor like but he he did do he took our equipment and did some tillage so we were planting into a, a tilled environment when we came along to do the interseeding I thought man we can't hold this thing shallow enough because it was going in half an inch and so our first year or two we were too deep because some of the stuff you see on YouTube people say plant for the big seeds and the small seeds will look after themselves. Well, we discovered on our soils, no, we got to plant for the small seeds. So we were, we were making ground contact, but we were not closing over top of the seed. On my neighbors, we were closing everything and we pulled in and we harvested his corn first and it was a hundred percent stand. It was gorgeous. I thought, oh, we finally have it figured out. I pull into ours and go, oh, <laughs> we don't have it figured out. So this year we set it a little deeper. We probably set it around a quarter to a half inch looking for some soil cover. Now, what I've looked at, we have a nice stand, but we've had lots of moisture. I'll give you a, a better a better report card come harvest and then into the into the year so the learning goes on are there any planting decisions that you've made in the past that were a mistake and i'm not trying to put you on the spot i'm trying to say are there things that you could help other people avoid because you've already made that mistake and have learned from it and maybe there isn't but it's oh, just the I, I guess that's a, that's a larger conversation and I'd invite anybody to, to call us because, uh, you know, the, the things we've learned, for instance, the nitrogen off the back of the row unit, the first couple of years, we had a flex tube taking it right down to the ground, a, a steel tube and then a short flex tube. Well, we found that flex tube dancing. It covered the back of the row unit. Okay, so what? Well, when the corn emerged, the corn was looking stressed. And I'm going, why is the corn looking stressed? Well, we were dropping nitrogen all over that seeding row mm. and, and the corn was picking that up as it came through it. So off came the flex tubes and we concentrate, you know, that, that's something we had to figure out. Uh, when, when we first started with the case planter, the first year case puts a, a reduced inside diameter gauge wheel, which means right alongside the blade, there's quite, quite a rise. To, if you're in a conventional situation to allow the soil to shove out of the way. Well, on our soils, that reduced inside diameter gauge, let the sidewall blow right out. And I thought, oh, that looks cool. We're creating a row zone. Well, we got hot and dry, like midway through planting. And I could 
point to the field at what time 10 o'clock Monday morning hit and after that we had really poor germination mm -hmm. for the and we've took to stu because it was it was worked but it was large knobs and the soil dried out to the depth of the seed before it got imbibed with moisture and you go oh so then we began to make to play uh, you know we wound up changing the closing wheels we wound up changing the depth gauge wheels we wound up changing lots of things so yeah there's there's lots of mistakes that are learning opportunities that are absolutely learning opportunities and and i'd welcome the chance to talk to anybody to help them if i could help them avoid five years of my learning curve i'd be grateful um advice to people on on purchasing seating equipment what are the what, what things should they be thinking about can the planter get it to the depth that it needs to be? And, and, and like I said, because we don't have, when we're in heavy cover, we don't have moisture stratification. When I talk about the slot being open on top, that's not wet. That's not compacted. That's just, there's so much roots there and you get a cover crop mat rolled down that's a half inch thick. The wheels can't go through that at five and a half mile an hour. And so, but we have found that you get below that and the soil is crumbly. So you still have to make sure the field is in condition and that that doesn't change very good and so is there anything next that you're planning or right now you're sort of in uh, in a place where you no, need to be we're fine-tuning and and looking at at biologies and that kind of stuff to see where things go but uh, we're actively tuning but i think in terms of planting setups we're, we're happy with where we're at right now. Very good. So Larry, uh, on behalf of those that will have the opportunity to view this seminar, I just want to thank you and the family for letting uh, me follow you around last uh, summer and, uh, and being able to put this together and, and share your knowledge and enthusiasm of her agriculture with, with those that uh, will take this in. Yeah. And uh, you've said you're open to have Absolutely. people give you a shout and have a chat. And so uh, we'll, uh, we'll let people have that. Yeah, thanks. Thank you very much. It's a privilege.